Hello, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Andrea Norgren, and I am part of the coordination desk for the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program, which is organizing this webinar today. The Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program is one of six programs under the One Planet Network, which supports the global shift to sustainable consumption and production and the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 12. The Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program aims to foster the uptake of sustainable lifestyles as the common norm. It is co-led by the government of Sweden, represented by Stockholm Environment Institute, and Japan's Ministry of the Environment, represented by Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. This webinar, titled Behavioral Insights for Policymaking, Reducing Plastic Use, brings together a wide range of experts to look at two areas within behavioral insights, nudging and campaigns to reduce single-use plastics, and marks the launch of the two reports within the SLE program on the topic. The agenda you can see on this slide, but a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. You are all muted during the main part of the webinar. And please use the Q&A function for questions. And please indicate who you are asking the question to. That would help. And the speakers will try to, uh, try to address the questions during the webinar. However, questions to the panelists will be addressed at the end. So we are recording this webinar, so please keep that in mind. So to get started, I want to introduce Stephen Stone, Chief of UN Environments Resources and Markets Branch, who has more than 20 years of professional experience in environmental and natural resource management. Stephen will moderate today's webinar. And over to you. Thank you very much, Andrea, and good afternoon, colleagues, those of you who are in our time zone. Um, it's, it's wonderful today to be looking back and forward at the same time. Uh, it's wonderful to be with the Stockholm Environment Institute, with the Swedish EPA, and all of the colleagues who are working so hard on sustainable lifestyles, sustainable living as part of the One Planet Network. I remember when we were back in Nairobi, not so long ago, talking about nudging inside of UNEP and both you Andrea and Eva from the Swedish EPA were with us on that day when we thought very creatively with the behavioral insights team how can we bring the insights from behavioral economics from behavioral insights to our quest for enhanced sustainability today we learn more we've come from Nairobi actually to Stockholm a bit after that conference uh, that workshop and in in Stockholm there was a deep dive on sustainable living and many of the products that, Andrea, you just mentioned, were probably conceived back in Nairobi, further developed in Stockholm, and are seeing the light of day today, the just launched reports. So it's a great moment to unpack them, to explore them, and to dig deeper with the authors and also with the panel of experts who are with us today. So just two or three reflections from my part before we kick off. One is, we are a year in from lockdown. We are a year in from the pandemic. And we were talking about this the other day as we prepared for this event. And we were thinking, you know, what has changed in our lives? What has remained the same? What could we change as we hopefully one day return to normal in the not too distant future? I would wager, if anything, our plastic use has gone up tremendously just because of all the barriers we're putting between ourselves and the pathogen between this virus. Um, but even before, even before the lockdown, some, some sort of jarring data that I want to share with you. Plastics, a $1.2 trillion industry a year, $1.2 trillion estimated. That was before COVID. Um, more than 50% of the plastics that exist in the world today were produced since the year 2000. And that was before COVID. More than 300 million tons of plastic waste produced every year, more than the mass of every single living person on the earth. And that was before COVID. What's happening today? What can we do about it to reduce this waste around plastic? Well, we have a wonderful panel to tell us about that. And to kick it off, we have a representative from the Ministry of Environment in Sweden, 
Sophia Tingstorp is the Deputy Director of Chemicals Unit at the Ministry of Environment Sweden. The main responsibilities are global chemicals issues, sustainable consumption and production, and waste issues. And Sophia, before I give you the floor, I also want to say you are the person who is raising ambition in the High Ambition Alliance for Chemicals, and I hope you can raise our ambition today as well. Sophia, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to here, here, here today. It's, I'm very glad to be part of this seminar. Today, our con consumption and production are unsustainable, at least by diversity loss and ecosystem de degradation and climate change. We need to transform our society, but to reach success, our future does not only depend on innovative solutions, it also depends on our behavior. We, how we choose to live, how we work and, and play as global consumers. Therefore, it's important that we highlight behavior insights and how that would be beneficial, for example, to so one of our environment challenges, the management of plastic, which are one of the topics uh, here today. So next slide. Yes, please. Um, as you're are aware we are witnessing a dramatic surge in plastic pollution on the environment. In, in, in short, plastics are found in disturbing quantities in our ocean, in our air, in, uh, in the soil. And therefore, we also see that, uh, not therefore, but it is a fundamental gap also in, in the existing international legal and policy framework to manage plastics. And therefore, uh, this is a key priority to Sweden to strengthen the global governance to address this urgent challenge. We need to rethink how we deal with plastics from the beginning to the end. Sweden considers that a global agreement on plastics is required to address the needs. Marine litter and mi microplastic cross borders and must be addressed across borders. This is a global concern. We hope that a negotiated mandate can be adopted by the UN Environmental Assembly in February next year. Moving from the global world to the national uh, level in Sweden, may I have the next slide, please? Thank you. We must also act within Sweden to on, on, on the use of plastic. And to set you in the perspective, this is what Sweden used, and this is from 2019. So what Stephen said before, maybe this has increased a, a bit. But well, Swedes use half to a billion disposable cups containing plastics. And also 2019, we used 200,000 tons of plastic packaging were put on the Swedish market. And only 15 to 20% is material recycled, and the rest is, of course, uh, used by energy recovered. Uh, so we do have some things to do naturally. And on the next slide, you can see that we are working to implement the single use directive, the EU directive on the single use plastic. Uh, and we had done an inquiry and they have put forward some uh, proposal. First, a prohibition for single use plastic on the Swedish market that dispose of mugs must contain more than 10%. Uh, mugs that do um, contain more than 10% will be prohibited. There should also be a requirement to offer to have the drink or the food served in a reusable mug or a lunchbox when you, for example, do the takeoff, uh, the takeaway delivery. And also, we are increasing the return scheme for plastic and metal bottles. And there should also be a requirement that packaging shall be possible to material recycle and bottles and plastic packaging need to contain at least 30% of recycled material in 2030. And last thing is that there will be a requirement for caps and lids to be attached to the beverage container throughout the use. And further, not to forget that we also introduce a litter fee uh, to be charged for certain uh, manufacturing um, of, of products, um, plastic uh, products, sorry. And with all this, um, to be in line with the EU requirement, we um, thought to be finished by 3rd of July this year. And we also hope that this, all of these requirements will be 
lead to a better and common approach to tackle the plastic issue and move to sustainable uh, consumption and production. And by that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for that overview. And it's great to hear about the efforts on global governance for plastics and also um, the efforts in, to move forward on single-use plastic products and the directive um, from Europe. And we have uh, Federico Pocha from the, um, the European Commission with us today to say more about that as well. Thank you so much, Sophia. And now we turn to our next uh, speaker, who is Elisa Tonda. Um, she is the head of the consumption and production unit inside of uh, UNEP, the UN Environment Program. Um, her her shop does a lot with plastics, with the circular economy, uh, with textiles and all the other parts of these value chains that sometimes create unintended consequences as they're creating value for consumers. Um, and I like to think of Elisa as at the very epicenter of the circular economy. So Elisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and good day to everybody who is connected to the workshop today. Um, I'll be starting the, intro the intervention and if we could please move to the next slide, just giving a sense that I'll be probably zoom in a little bit out compared to the focus of the rest of the session, just to give a little bit of context of what we are discussing uh, today. And I'll probably go back to the earlier session of the UN Environment Assembly, the fourth session, when uh, Resolution 6 was approved, a resolution that focuses on marine plastic litter and microplastics, which in its paragraph 55 was specifically calling for attention uh, from the 10-year frameworks of program on sustainable consumption and production to help frame and define guidelines that would help to somehow activate the different actors in the sustainable consumption and production system to move ahead and to address uh, the plastic pollution agenda. And in this sense, really engaging actors from uh, all sectors, from all geographies to really take an active role in addressing plastic pollution. And if we could move to the next slide, uh, there came the point in time when indeed uh, the 10-year the framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production and its one planet network, its network of more than 700 actors across uh, different geographies and across different sectors and across different thematic areas started to think how best to engage in addressing this challenge. And they took the initiative from some of the existing studies that had been developed by UNEP on this specific subject that were already pushing, again, different stakeholders to rethink our production and consumption system in such a way that plastic would be conceived differently from now, would be considered as a material that we want to keep in our economy from, for as long as possible and keep away from the environment for as long as possible and engage all the different actors that are part of this production and consumption system into that transformation. Thinking of the full life cycle of plastic products and again, focusing our attention on those interventions that really can shift the needle in the consumption and production system. And if we can move to the next slide, you will get a glance of how that system has been depicted from the point in time when we select the material that goes into the product from the design of the products that enter into our market to its processing and transformation to the point in the life of the product when they are used and to the end of the first or multiple lives of the product and the opportunities for them to be cycled back in the economy. And what the, the programs that are part of the One Planet Network decided to concentrate their attention on was specifically on the use phase, the phase that you see circled in the image that you currently have on the screen and think on how we could trigger change from the entry point of users of plastic across the entire system, be that upstream in rethinking the design and rethinking the products, as well as downstream in rethinking the, uh, the collection and returning into the economy system. 
So one choice was already done, prioritize what happens in the use phase. And, and you will see perfectly well how the conversation of today fits 100% into uh, what is being uh, uh, highlighted here in the slide. And if we can move to the next slide, you will see the second, uh, let's say, uh, priority that has been given to the attention of what has happened in the different programs of the One Planet Network. So among all plastic uh, products that are part of our economy, specific attention has been given to plastic packaging and its flow again in our production and consumption system because of its share, but also because of the huge economic loss associated with those products not being returned in the economy and the negative externalities that again are associated with those products ending up polluting our environment. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll just give you a snapshot of what the uh, whole set of programs of the One Planet Network have been concentrating on in their effort of really mobilizing the sustainable consumption and production community in addressing the plastic challenge. Uh, the team working on consumer information has been providing guidance on how to make that information more usable and more relevant and uh, better at triggering action, both in terms of uh, the point in time when we select the product that we want to purchase, but also importantly at the point in time when we finish one of the lives of the product and want to get rid of it, but still want to make sure that this product enters the economy back again. So how information can be conveyed to consumer to this end. A specific category of consumer has also been uh, addressed, which are government consumers through their public procurement decision with a massive opportunity to transform the market. So how can specification in public procurement be designed in such a way that they promote that system and that economy within which plastic remains uh, in, uh, in use for as long as possible. And two sectors have really been the focus of the attention uh, of this effort, one being the tourism sector and there again the possibility of engaging tourism into that transformation and for tourists to keep the message beyond their uh, vacation experience and bring that to their uh, ordinary life also when uh, out of vacation was really one of the focus that we have been concentrating on as well as the huge opportunities related to packaging in the food system. And within that context, uh, the two reports that will be presented today, as you will see, are really key pieces of the puzzle to help the sustainable consumption and production community to really take action at all levels to address the challenge of plastic pollution. And Stephen, I hope I created sufficient appetite to hear more about the two reports and I give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Elisa. I'm sure that you have created some appetite for what's inside of those two really, really good reports that have been launched uh, just yesterday and are being uh, commemorated today. And uh, I also want to salute Elisa, the work you've been doing on the science because a lot of the numbers that we're seeing here about the volumes of plastic and plastic waste uh, comes from work that Elisa has been doing with Jorans Mili Canales and others uh, at UNEP and of course partners at Ellen MacArthur Foundation and even beyond. And uh, Sophia, to your point about glo global governance, the science is being created to backstop the governance efforts. So really good to hear from both of you. So now we move to one of the report authors, uh, Nicholas Lanninging. He's Director of Behavioral Insights at PBM. Uh, he's a behavioral psychologist and he's got oodles of experience in this domain of how do you actually shift behavior and here we're going to hear Nicholas talking a bit about the report and specifically about single-use plastics. Nicholas over to you. Thank you so much Stephen and uh, good afternoon everyone. So yeah I'm uh, one of the authors of this report and uh, let's move on to the next slide please. And there we have it and we can even go straight into the background. So Ian, you can change the next one. 
So the background to this report, which I uh, really hope you all take a, uh, take a look at. Uh, first off, as you all know, and as Sofia uh, explained very well, uh, takeaway cups, the use of uh, disposable cups significantly contribute to plastic pollution. And this is partly a behavioral problem. Uh, no news there, to be honest. But what we wanted to, to look into with this report is, first off, could the application of nudging complement traditional policy, policy tools uh, when it comes to influencing behaviors uh, related to using disposable cups? And if so, how might those nudges uh, look? So we can move on to the next slide. So just to give you some guidance on when reading this report, it is uh, structured in the same way that we always structure projects uh, regarding behavioral informed policies. We always follow these five steps. First off, we get a behavioral understanding of, of a particular problem. What uh, are the desired behaviors? What are the undesired behaviors? Second, we go uh, quite deep into looking at those desired behaviors and try to get an understanding of what are the barriers surrounding those behaviors. Once we created that understanding, we design our, uh, our interventions, our nudges, which I will share shortly. Then keep in mind that this report, we haven't actually made any experiments or any pilot studies, uh, hopefully we will see quite a few implementations of the nudges in the future. But what we have provided in the report is a quite extensive guide on how to go about when implementing these, uh, these three nudges that we have written about. And lastly, we also provide a framework for how do we scale these efforts? How do we implement it perhaps on other policy areas, perhaps into other countries? So. That's something you will find at the end of the report as well. So if we change slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the term nudging, but just to make it clear what we're talking about here. So we're talking about a, a policy instrument aimed at influencing uh, decision making within the particular choice environment. So what we mean by that is that we, we are it's very specific where we sort of add these kind of design changes to the choice environment. Uh, and the aim is, of course, to increase the desired amount of behavior without any, adding any restrictions or uh, perhaps some financial incentives. So nudging is a very suitable approach for issues that we used to call um, intention, act, intention behavior gap. So that is topics where the, the audience intention that's in place. One wants to do the right thing, but somehow the situation makes it tricky to act on that intention. So we want to sort of reduce friction or experiment with the choice environment to make it easier to act on one's intention. And uh, the last couple of years has been a rise in what we call uh, green nudges, and those are of course trying to promote behaviors related to pro-environmental choices. So let's change slide again. What we, the first thing we did is we sort of broke down this policy area of single use dispo, disposable cups in a process we call behavioral reduction. So we looked into specific arenas uh, where relevant behaviors might appear. Uh, and this ended up us focusing on first off trying to increase consumption of coffee uh, set at cafes uh, in stores rather than to have your coffee to go or take away. And then we also looked into a lot of behavior surrounding the usage of reusable cups. So both actually uh, filling up your coffee with a reusable cup, but also bringing your reusable cup uh, to the office or the cafe and also, of course, buying, purchasing an uh, actual reusable cup. So this is the process and this ended up as focus on these kind of behaviors which we then analyzed. So Ian, next slide please. So we have quite an extensive explanation on the psychological drivers shaping these kind of behaviors, the, the usage of a reusable cup and why people choose to do the underside behavior, and that is to use a disposable cup. 
Uh, we've written quite extensively of this, but it's psychology, so it's not rocket science. I mean, why do people use the disposable cup? Hygiene, very important factor, especially uh, these days, hygiene, the hygiene argument has sort of been on the rise. Convenience, of course, I mean, there's no extra charge at the moment for, for using a disposable cup, so it's time efficient. And then, of course, consumer culture, we've seen a rise in this kind of takeaway culture. And lastly, we've seen some signs that there's there might be some misconceptions just about the, the environmental impacts of these disposable cups and perhaps also some skepticism on 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 more sustainable option. But keep in mind, this is sort of the the the, the weakest data point. The other one trumps that. So uh, having said that, Ian, let's look into the nudges. So we provided three nudges and the first one, it's a fairly simple one. Uh, it's called a default. We want to introduce a, a soft new de default. Um, default is a very common, uh, commonly used tool when it comes to green nudges. So basically what we want to add here is that baristas, person, staff at cafes will no longer have the takeaway cup as a default. Instead, they have to ask uh, the consumer, would you like a cup for that, co for that coffee? And if the consumer doesn't tell you, and otherwise they will be served in a reusable ceramic cup. So a fairly simple, non-intrusive way to try and promote the usage of, uh, of having your coffee to stay in a ceramic cup. Uh, the next slide, please, Ian. So as I said, this is uh, far from a wild nudge. It's, it's really common, especially when it comes to pro-environmental pro behaviors. The World Economic Forum suggested something similar related to, to takeaway food, where they suggested that the home delivery services and takeout orders should create the, that the new default would be that you wouldn't get your meal with a single use um, plastic cutlery. Instead, you will have to ask the consumer, would you like plastic with that? So, so we'll see who, who, who gets first on this kind of plastic nudge. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. The second one, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more intrusive, and this uh, also serves the function of sort of smoothing out the transition from uh, disposable to reusable. So what we want to do here, we target the self-service stations where you can dispense your coffee uh, on your own. We want to create that behavior into two behaviors. So you would first, you would, be, uh, you would have to go to the counter to get your disposable cup before going to the self-dispense the, the self -dispense, uh, coffee machine. So adding some friction to that behavior and also perhaps providing some more benefits uh, to the behavior, bring your own reusable cup as you would have a quicker, more convenient serving. Next slide, please, Ian. Uh, again, a very commonly used policy tool, the UK within a year, We'd add, we'll add some similar kind of policy measures regarding unhealthy food, where unhealthy food will be restricted from being promoted at store aisles and at checkouts. So we've seen this before and we've seen that it's uh, have a moderate to high impact on, on consumer behavior. So let's move on to the, the third and last one. Uh, and that is the wild one, uh, focusing on reusable cups. Um, I was very happy to hear that, Sophia, that there's perhaps will be some policy that you have to promote reusable uh, mugs or cutlery at your store. So what we wanted to do with this third notch is change the framing. Instead of talking about reusable cups, we want to talk about refillable cups. So cafes who sell refillable cups would have to add some extra value that the refillable cup would come with, say, 10 free servings. So there would be an extra charge, thus charging the refillable cup with some extra value, thus hopefully increasing the likelihood that people won't forget to bring their refillable cup next time they have their coffee. We see that that's a, a barrier to take seriously. So when we first thought about this nudge, it felt kind of crazy. However, this was soon a year ago since then if we change slide please we actually seen quite a few initiatives that could go very well 
with this nudge. Uh, cafes at, in the US, also here in Sweden, starting to use a subscription-based business model where you subscribe and get infinite amount of refills to your coffee. And our idea was, of course, to attach that kind of loyalty program to the usage of a refillable cup. So I sure hope that there's uh, a couple of you within the industry looking at this because uh, I think you're onto something good. Uh, and I'm seeing I'm running out of time. So Ian, let's move on to the last slide, which is about key policy recommendations. Um, again, you will find quite an extensive writing on this one. Uh, could we could we change slides? Two more slides, please. There you have it. So I just wanted to end with some recommendations. And I heard the first recommendation is, of course, read the report, uh, especially the executive summary. What we first suggest you to do is to, to uh, have a workshop series where you invite policymakers, behavior practitioners, as well as market stakeholders to sort of figure out how could we go about in testing these nudges. First off, to see if it has an impact on the desired behavior, and that is to increase reducible uh, behaviors associated with reusable cups, but also look into will this have a positive or negative business impact? Because the business, the market stakeholders we've been in touch with, they are very positive to this change and they were very open to share data, insights and thoughts. However, there's a business perspective. Right now, there's a pandemic perspective as well. Promoting refillable or reusable cups, a lot of the chains have actually banned this due to the hygiene argument, argument uh, as well as serving the coffee inside the coffee shop. Uh, but there will be uh, a normal after this, and they are more than happy to continue this conversation and to actually test behavioral based policy measures to see if we could move towards a more sustainable way of having our, our hot beverages. So uh, I think I will end that because I'm already past my time. So sorry for that. And I really hope that you all will have a look at the, at the summary at least of this very extensive report. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And that was fascinating. And uh, I think you've all whetted our appetite even further. Um, you've talked about changing the defaults. You've talked about increasing friction. And you also talked about sort of longer term behavior or repeat behavior with coffee subscription uh, nudges, which is fascinating. I think for um, the real world, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. Our next speaker will actually pick up from here. Uh, she is Ellie Moss. She's the author of Reducing Plastic Pollution Campaigns That Work. Uh, she's the founder of Moss and Mullick, Mollusk Consulting, uh, which advises companies and people and governments on the shift to a regenerative uh, circular economy. So Ellie, picking up from, from Nicholas here, we'd like to hear about how campaigns can help us with this whole nudging effort to reduce our plastic footprint. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you, Nicholas, uh, for your wonderful report. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so we spent uh, a number of months uh, doing research to understand how do we shift uh, consumption uh, away from single use plastic? So next slide, Ian. One of the phenomena that we were aware of and that we learned even more about uh, in digging into this question is when you ask people if they care, they say yes. And when you ask people if they're going to do something about it, they say yes. But when you look at what people are actually doing, the behavior often does not align with what people are telling you that they're going to do. This is a known sustainability phenomenon. We've been observing this for a long time in the broader sustainability space. Uh, but it's quite pronounced, especially when it comes to plastic usage. Uh, people want to use less plastic. Uh, they say that they do, they say they care about it, it's a priority, but when it comes to that decision in the store, uh, you know, either they don't have a good alternative or for whatever reason, uh, the behavior just doesn't align with uh, the intention. So this report really looks at how can we design campaigns that can truly shift that, that intention into an actual behavior? And how can campaigns uh, support the, this intention that people have to consume less single-use plastic? Next slide, please. 
In doing this work, uh, we reviewed, I think, over 100 scientific papers. There's actually over 65 cited in the report that we ended up writing. Um, and we also looked at campaigns in the real world. So we looked at 50 campaigns um, and analyzed them based on how they uh, matched or didn't match with what we were seeing in the research. Um, and from all of that research and analysis, uh, looking both at the academic literature and at the real world, we identified six strategies that, that seemed to be quite effective. Uh, we identified four strategies that we consider to be watchouts, uh, where they can be very effective when used well, but they can also backfire and actually have uh, unintended or uh, out, uh, unintended or sort of opposite consequences of what we're looking for. Um, and then there's four things that we observed that campaigns tend to do that we considered common mistakes. So things that are sort of easy with traps to fall into um, that seem like the right thing to do, but that actually are uh, not effective in, in driving behavior. Next slide, please. These are the uh, six, four, and four that I just referenced. And what I'm going to do with the short amount of time that I have here is to give you a little bit more detail on <clears throat> the six effective strategies uh, and tell you what we learned in researching these. And then I'll give you a quicker overview of the watchouts and the common mistakes. Um, and I do want to let you know that in addition to the lengthy report, which you can review, and I hope that you will, there's also a very beautiful website that's been created that has the highlights. Uh, so if you want to just get the, uh, the short version, you can check out that website and I hope that you will. Next slide, please. So the one of the effective strategies that we looked at is customization. Uh, we all know that we are all different and that, of course, is still true when it comes to consumption choices and behaviors. There's quite a few ways in which customization matters when it comes to talking to people about their plastic consumption. Um, it, it can correlate with demographics, things like education level, gender, um, socioeconomic level. So that's one thing to consider, but that's not necessarily the most important thing in this case. Um, there's psychological profiling that has been done uh, in some academic research that's very interesting that shows that some people are predisposed to care more about the environment when it's personified, when it's sort of given human characteristics. Other people are very susceptible to cuteness. So if things actually are made to be cute, that's actually very motivating for them and that drives behavior. Um, another element of customization that should be thought about is life stage. So there's quite a bit of research that's looked at are different moments in people's lives, whether it's having children, going to university, retiring, do those correlate with an openness to change habits or consumption patterns? Uh, so looking at all of these different factors um, can really help determine how to customize your messaging in your campaign so that you're speaking to people in a way that's more likely to drive behavior for that person at that moment. Um, and given that person specific, uh, or a group of people, obviously, we're not doing one-on-one -on -one campaigning just yet, but groups of people that are likely to, to be responsive to certain messages. Next slide. Uh, number two is good social norms. And this is, uh, we, we put good social norms here in the effective strategies because it is one of the most effective ways to drive behavior. Uh, you'll notice that inadvertently uh, reinforcing bad norms is one of our uh, watch outs uh, or one of our common mistakes. Um, so this is very much a, a double edged sword, but when you use it well, it is one of the most powerful strategies. Uh, people like to be doing what what kind of everyone else is doing. You know, we have a very strong social wiring uh, as humans. And when you tell people, for example, that 95% of people agreed that prohibiting plastic bags to avoid contamination was a good idea, that creates almost a self-reinforcing um, idea in people's heads who maybe were unsure or maybe thought, oh, it doesn't really matter. You're more likely to get them to sort of get on board with something like that. If you create a visual way of creating a social norm, so for example, there's a campaign where people designed these custom tote bags that were reusable bags that could be used uh, across New York City uh, with um, independent bodegas and, and shops that that became a visual way of kind of being part of what people are doing. So good social norms have a lot of potential to help people uh, do the right thing. Um, if, however, you have a social norm, which is uh, sort of the wrong thing to do, but it's what everyone does. So for example, there's some interesting research on, um, it's not related to plastic, but collecting illegal, illegally collecting firewood at campsites or in, in national parks. Um, if you tell people that 
87% of people uh, illegally collect firewood, and that's why they shouldn't do it, that actually creates permission for people to do it because they think, oh, well, everyone's doing it. So we need to be careful with how we use uh, social norms. Next slide, please. One of the things that we noticed in campaigns as we were observing, uh, as we were analyzing them, was that um, a lot of campaigns were about don't, don't do this, don't use straws, don't use single use plastic. Um, and it didn't always give people what they can do. Uh, and what we found is that, especially when it comes to making plastic choices, um, people are confused. People know that some things are bad, but they don't know which things are good. And they don't always know how they can be part of the solution. And so in a campaign, rather than telling people everything that they shouldn't do, um, really telling people what they can do, presenting them with positive actions and positive solutions and ways to be uh, you know, part of that solution um, is much more effective. And especially when you're looking at behaviors, um, giving people a behavior that they can adopt and feel really good about, as opposed to just telling them what not to do, where they don't always necessarily have uh, a good option is, um, is much more effective. Next slide. Number four is catalyzing commitment. Um, one of the things that behavioral research has shown is that people like to um, be consistent. They, they like to have a consistent sense of self. And so when we say that we will do something, we have a very strong motivation then to actually do it and to actually follow through with it. Uh, this is especially true for public commitments. So if you make a public commitment, then there's um, even more motivation and pressure to be consistent with that commitment and to follow through. Um, there's a reputational element that connects to that. People want to be seen as someone who follows through with their commitments. So encouraging people as part of a campaign to sign on to a commitment or to tell people in their lives that they're going to make a change or to um, you know, put something on social media saying, I commit to doing this. Like there's a lot of ways you can kind of use that um, desire to be a good person and then to be consistent with that good person that you believe that you are uh, to help people stick to their um, stick to their choices. And it is uh, uh, definitely something to look at for, for people designing campaigns. Next slide. Um, number five is tapping positive emotions. So we often see campaigns which overwhelm us with scary, uh, discouraging, sad, tragic facts, pictures, you know, just horrifying things. And, and plastic pollution offers really a limitless supply of these very uh, unfortunate and sad um, pictures and stories and, and understanding the impact on people and the environment. Um, unfortunately, people have a limit for how much that will affect them, how much of that they'll actually let in, and how much that actually changes behavior. Um, when people are very discouraged, it doesn't necessarily, there's a small group of people for whom that does create a big uh, rebound uh, response, but many people just think, ah, oh, well, I guess I don't, I guess I can't do anything about it. Tapping into positive emotions has been shown in the research to actually drive behavior change that endures much longer than a fear or a, um, a fear response can. So um, can you get people to feel really proud of what they're doing or to feel proud of what their community is doing? Um, inspiring hope, helping people see how they can be optimistic, um, and even triggering love, which might sound a little cheesy, but love um, can be a very powerful um, emotion to tap into. And so if you can connect with people on that level, it actually has the ability to um, keep their behavior sticking uh, with what it needs to be. Okay, um, next slide, please. Quickly, this last one is show that it matters. So it's very easy to think, oh, well, you know, it's just one cup, it's just one bag, it's just one straw. Um, campaigns that emphasize that it's actually not. <laughs> it is, you know, it, and, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's 500, it's 1,000, you know, it really adds up. Um, it helps people recognize that, yeah, my, my choices do matter. So on the last slide, which is the next slide, I'll just give you a very quick overview of the um, watchouts and the common mistakes. And of course, you can find all of this on the um, website as well as in the report. Uh, two quick things that I'll point out. Uh, one is um, fear. As I mentioned, fear is incredibly powerful as a motivator. The problem is you have to tell people what they can actually do to alleviate the threat. And if you tell people, like for example, in this bottom right-hand corner, if you tell people that there's a chemical or a, a material, PVC, 
three, which is in everything um, and very toxic, but um, that there's nothing you can do to avoid it. That is um, very scary, but it's also, it's very disempowering as opposed to driving behavior change. Uh, so using fear when it, when it can be used and also using it judiciously. Um, I think fear is typically overused uh, in campaigns and, and people tend to become somewhat, um, uh, they, they tune it out. And then lastly, humor. So I would say the biggest opportunity that we have in campaigns going forward is finding new ways to use humor. Humor is very powerful. It can act as a social critique without making people feel bad. Um, it's very memorable. Um, however, you need to make sure that the humor is actually aligned with the change that you're trying to create and you need to, you need to avoid unintentional consequences. So the upper right hand corner is a set of plastic bags. A store um, chose to use these plastic bags because they thought that they'd be um, people would be too embarrassed to take them. And instead, people thought they were hilarious and actually came to the store just to get the bags. So um, another example of how humor can be very motivating, but can also actually um, get the wrong response. So I know I'm past my time. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak about this report. I hope everyone will take a look at it. Um, and uh, and use these uh, tools. I think that they have the potential to really um, have a huge impact on driving behavior change. So thank you so much and back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, very powerful toolbox and I'm sure it's of interest to everyone who, who wants to influence in this space and certainly for the One Planet Network, um, a driving concern. How do we reach people in a way that it actually changes behavior over time? And, and the tips that you've shared with us and some of the findings from your research, really just fascinating. For those who are listening in and watching today, you may ask questions directly to Ellie and to Nicholas in the chat box. I should have said this earlier, but if you have some question that's burning around the research or the reports or something that's nagging you, feel free to put it in the chat box. They are with us, they will respond. Uh, and we should see that chat box uh, lighting up with your questions. Um, so now we actually turn to another part of the um, of the webinar today, where we get some additional voices into the uh, mix. And these are all individuals who are working in this space and have a lot to share. So um, going from right to left, from as I see it, is um, Fikre, Fikre Zahai. He's an environmental economist at the Swedish EPA, and he's done a lot of work with um, incentives for changing behavior. Um, next is uh, Safia Qureshi. She's the founder and CEO of the Cup Club. There's a lot more behind that than you might think, but Cup Club is essentially a play to get people to move towards reusable, um, reusable cups as opposed to plastics. And Safia has a really interesting CV and a list of experiences to share with us. I believe she's joining by phone today because the technology has not been favorable. Uh, Rachel uh, Gray is with us from RAP UK. She's a behavioral change manager and has a lot of experience also in campaigns. So some very interesting links there, Ellie, to the work that uh, you've just presented. Uh, and last but not least is Federico Porra, who's with the European Commission, and he's the go-to person for circular economy, including the work on plastics. So a really great lineup um, to bomb, you, bomb them with your questions in the chat box live. And we have Andrea who's going to be filtering your questions to make sure that they're all very civil and uh, acceptable. As we kick it off, then the first question actually um, will be to you, uh, Fikre. And here's the question. These, of course, are moderated questions. So. We've seen a lot of bans or fees on plastic bags and straws that can si trigger significant backlash from citizens in some places and a lot of uh, a lot of movement in this area. So how can nudging and campaign strategies be used to both inform policy decision as well as their communication um, and the way they roll out with citizens? What can nudging and campaigns do to help in this? And Fikri, also your experience as an environmental economist, I think will be very interesting. How far do prices go in affecting behavior and what needs to pick up beyond prices? Fikre, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, it's a tough question. Uh, and um, I would say that clothes do not make a man, they say. And uh, is may, I, would, I would start answering, saying that I don't think that campaigns and uh, nudging would uh, change a good or bad policy. I mean that, by that I mean that there is a main policy that needs to target the, the, the behavioral problems. Uh, 
just to make an example, uh, well, uh, as uh, Ellie was saying, uh, actually the problems behind problem, uh, environmental problems is that we have a, uh, there is a conflict between individual interest and uh, collective interest. Sorry, my children, I have to say that. Um, um, so there is a, a conflict between individual interest and, and, and the society and the societal interest. And, and, and this conflict, in order, in order to be solved, it, it has to be targeted by tough um, policy instruments, I would say, like bans or, 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 or taxes. But uh, campaigns and nudging play an important role to, to make them good, to, to make them even work better. That is, uh, uh, that is, I think that's the role that the campaigns and and and, uh, and nudging would work, would uh, would contribute to, into policy. So, what is the question then? Is what is good policy? How do we do good uh, uh, prices or, or taxes or or, or market-based instruments, as I would like to to call them, uh, or or bans? Well. I would say that uh, to try to answer the, the question that Stephen uh, raised uh, is that one of the main problems is that I mean we know that police policy acceptance to be, policy to be accepted they need to be fair and they need to be also effective. Mm. And then the question is when are they effective and when are they fair? Uh, I would say that if we target the polluters today, for instance, we have millions of people driving out there. Uh, despite knowing that they will uh, pollute or, or, or have uh, health or environmental uh, effects that are not good. Still, we do take deliberate uh, choices to drive. So if we target these people that are driving today by fair policy and, 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 and basically we make the polluters pay for the, 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 the environmental problems they are causing, Basically, we are uh, applying the polluter principle. Uh, then, I think we, we could reach quite good policies. And the problem is, though, it's not always easy to 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 do this this type of policy to to imp uh, implement this type of policies, because it's very complicated sometimes to identify the polluter. Sometimes it's very difficult to reach the polluter. And uh, so in these cases, I think campaigns are very important. And in this case, I think um, nudging could be very important to, 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 um, to make the public understand the fairness and the effectiveness of different policies, uh, but also sometimes to, 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 uh, to have some kind of uh, information, informative information, like campaigns could be we have, for instance, many um, a lot of interest groups that are that uh, that would like to question different policies, and and uh, we have to stand against them. And campaigns mm -hmm. are very important to, to to put out there what what information do we have from science uh, about the environmental effects of different and polluting uh, behaviors. Mm. And last, I would also like to say that sometimes this complicated uh, since policy is complicated, sometimes uh, maybe. Even we as policymakers or, or uh, policymakers can make mistakes. In that case, we have to be also humble and understand maybe the public sometimes is right. Mm. Fascinating, Pique. Thank you so much for that. And and yes, it's a unique perspective from the Swedish EPA. You are a policy making body, and so it's great to hear your voice. And I was also thinking of um, this work by uh, I think it's Handel who called it the moral limits of markets. So how far did the pricing instruments go, and when do you need the social nudging that both Ellie and uh, Nicholas were speaking of, sort of the norms that keep us in line. I was also wondering about you know what's the difference between a nudge in Sweden versus a nudge in say New York City. You know, perhaps your cultural signifiers might be different, but this will be very interesting. Quickly, I'm going to come back to you. I have a question for Federico. Um, and Federico, we heard earlier from Sofia about um, the single use plastics directive at the EU level. You're working with the European Commission. Um, and given the recent EU directive on single use plastics, what can nudging contribute to its successful uptake in countries like Sweden, but beyond Sweden as well throughout the European community? Thank you, thank you, Stephen, and of course, thanks also to the organizer for uh, for inviting me. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, event, and of course, as well, we are uh, we are also interested in our on our side to to read more 
and to understand more the uh, the role of nudges based on the on the report that have been uh, just uh, introduced by the by the speakers indeed uh, when we talk about the circular economy in general and sustainable consumption and production plastics has been in the past few years i would say since 2018 at least in europe with the european plastic strategy one of the main sectors for the implementation of this new system level change it is from our perspective the circular economy when it comes to plastics maybe just a few uh, a few um, uh, sentences of what is the uh, the degree of the issue when it comes for example of marine litter especially specifically single use plastics in europe nowadays in european coasts between 80 and 85 percent of marine litter which is found in european coasts are actually coming from plastics um 50 percent of this plastic is actually single use plastic so we have a massive problem here that we need to uh, solve in, in in some in some way or in different ways at the same time and in fact uh, the proposal from the commission 2018 that has been adopted by the co-legislator last year in 2019 meaning the european parliament and the council is introducing specific action for the main uh, items that have been found actually in european coasts Depending on the availability of, of, uh, of alternatives, such alternatives need to be, of course, ready to use, sustainable and affordable at the same time, because of course the just transition aspect of, uh, of the circular economy is very important. In such cases, then a market ban or market restriction are going to take place by uh, 2021. For example, plates, cutlery and straws. But there are also other type of, uh, of uh, product groups that are not going to be actually affected by at least now in, in, in form of market bans, uh, bans, but are going to actually be addressed by other types of instruments. We can talk, for example, about extended producer responsibilities for tobacco filters made of plastics. We can talk about marking requirements. We can talk about uh, eco-design requirements for specific KCP products uh, made of plastic, of course. But there is one part of this directive that is actually in uh, Article 4 that I think it's interesting to take into consideration when it comes to the potential actually uh, support of nudging when it comes to actually implementing this vision for circular economy in Europe. And in Article 4, we say, and the co-legislator agreed in 2019, to achieve a sustained consumption reduction of specific single-use plastics items. One of those, for example, are cups. And it's interesting, of course, it's very relevant for us to hear that uh, one of the uh, one of the topics and one of the plastics items that have been actually targeted by this report is indeed on on uh, on, uh, on caps. And this gives you the idea that, of course, when it comes to uh, redu uh, reducing consumption of the single use plastics item, we can have, of course, economic instruments. We can have uh, target settings. This is uh, entirely up to member state to decide what is the real and the main uh, and the preferred uh, way to achieve this uh, this objective. But indeed, we consider as European Commission, but I think this is indeed a shared uh, feeling uh, between the national legislator. The nudging at least can play an important role in the context of a group of different actions that evidently needs to work together in synergy in a comprehensive way to target the entire life cycle of products. So in a really circular economy perspective. Um, and maybe two, three words on, I think, on the, on the role of nudging that indeed is going to be important from our perspective as one of the actions within potentially if member states find it useful for the implementation of the directive. But also I would say even more and even more broadly than only the directive on single use plastics. We have, as mentioned before, a plastic strategy the plastic strategy, therefore, is not targeting only single use plastics, also other type of, uh, of plastic items. It's a comprehensive uh, uh, strategy that is being still implemented by 2018 on the European level. It also includes global actions and the international agreement on plastics that is been uh, uh, mentioned before is one of the potential follow up of this perspective of really trying to look at the plastics value chain from a circular perspective, also to empower at the same time, consumers will be part of the solution. But in March 2021, we have adopted at European Commission level the new Circular Economy Action Plan. And within the action plan that is basically proposing a vision for the next four years for actions to implement circular economy, sustainable consumption, and the idea 
that the system level change needs to also receive supports from the public, needs to be just at the same time, is very important. And therefore, nudging from our perspective is one of the potential, I would say, tools that we as policymakers have in order to, in a way, substantiate, in a way, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, this approach that is comprehensive and is, in a way, mixing regulatory frameworks, because, of course, legislation and regulation are the key drivers, uh, especially environmental policies in Europe, but also the same trying to try to engage, for example, with economic actors. So indeed, when it comes to nudging, from my perspective, it's not only, of course, a matter for uh, policymakers, but also economic actors can indeed uh, be uh, actors for change. I, I think, for example, about retailers. So the role of retailers in indeed ensuring sustainable consumption by using eventually their own tools to, to have these uh, possibilities. Mm. So mm. I would say this is uh, from our perspective where we stand. And of course, I'll be happy to discuss more in case we, there is any, any questions. But thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks very much, Federico. So the economic actors are part of the solution and they're operating in the real economy and they also need to make profits, right, to stay in business. Otherwise, they, they go belly up. So we were talking about um, um, cafes and restaurants who are really struggling right now. And Safia, the next question is to you, actually, and you're somebody who's operating in the space. Um, I know you're with us by phone, so we'll just try out the technology here. But does nudging have a place alongside other policy instruments to decrease single use plastics in cafes and restaurants? And what do we need to bear in mind, given where we are in the pandemic and the lockdown? Hi, um, yes. That's that's a great fantastic question and it's um, it's a pleasure to join you all. And apologies, I can't be seen by yourselves. I'm observing you, so I, I actually am following the the live broadcast. Um, so to answer the question, firstly, what I want to do is just take a step back before before you design. And I my background is um, design and architecture, so I've I've built um, for cities and the built environment for ten years, and then I started to look at this particular issue around single-use reuse systems or more sustainable consumption models um, such as Cut Club uh, to address this issue. And the first and fundamental thing is convenience. So before you sort of design or set up to create a new service design which optimizes um, um, you really have to question um, what is specifically uh, the needs of the customer, and this is end users that I'm referring to, how do you make this as convenient an option as what they currently predominantly use, which is single use? So before you sort of get into the, the, the depths of trying to understand nudge tactics, it's really questioning the user experience. Is that different? Can I give them a better product? Um, what is the newness here? And what is the ultimate, um, you know, delight? Or sort of get as a customer from a reusable container that can be returned versus a single use that needs to find a bin. So these are elements that go into the design development phases. And yes, the user experience um, in terms of how you map that out is to have certain motivation. So when you are asking somebody to do something, how do you reward them? And that's probably how we create, I guess, the best um, nudge, as some folks would uh, describe it here. For me, it's, it comes under the, the sort of um, main bucket of um, behavior change is ele the element of uh, reward needs to be something that a customer is aware of in the beginning and then provided at the end. And by that, I mean, what we do, for example, is we we allow customers to purchase their daily coffee, but opt into reusables. Uh, we ask them to pre-register with us and they can go into any participating cafe and uh, show their ID and away with one of our reusable containers. They then return it to the nearest drop point and those drop points are again available, uh, mapped out in the app itself. And on the return of the packaging is when we provide them with five points. So we reward packaging. We don't reward them for taking away the packaging. And there's a big, big difference in that. What you want to try and do is reward behavior. 
behavior is not opting in, behavior is returning. We need to see that packaging returned. We need to see that packaging reused multiple times um, to really sustain ourselves as a credible reuse company that's eliminating waste. It means that we have to have a high return rate of our packaging. Today, we celebrate a 95% return rate um, across retail. And one of the key fundamentals for that is uh, what I've just described, uh, what some of you call nudge, I call a behavior change, is um, providing a reward and an incentive. And these points are aggregated and we can work with brands to do different things with these points. It's sort of essentially a digital loyalty sort of thing. And we've seen this um, very successfully demonstrated in exercise apps, um, in lots of other cross-disciplinary technology um, led uh, platforms where people genuinely get excited about the aspect of aggregating points which then go towards something. So that's the first. The second is actually to do with the, the finances. So when you are as a customer, when once you've registered, what we don't do is put a value on the packaging itself as what instead we do is we create what's called a smart system. So we say to a customer, enter your details, save your card on file. It's a free system for you to use. In the event that you don't return the packaging, we will deduct the value of that from the payment information you have provided. And that for us is a much, much better um, setup because what it does is it creates a sense of, um, I guess, uh, it creates a sense of urgency in a customer or the understanding that this item that they have just borrowed does not belong to them. And this is what goes into the behavior change psychology. The moment you apply a, an exchange which is monetary and it's in the form of a deposit and you have charged a customer for it, in their mind, they have purchased that item. They own it. And so what you're basically signaling to customers is only in the event that you are close by and you return it, we can refund you the value. Um, so we strong this, it's called a dumb system. What it does is it doesn't hold a customer accountability. It gives a product to a customer, and then it's basically doing it industry-wide saying, well, it's a customer's fault, they haven't returned it. I mm. would strongly argue against this. It's not. If you've designed that system, you've basically encouraged a customer to believe that they own it. Mm. And you haven't created enough of a drive for them to want to return it. And this is the biggest difference with when you walk into a, a library, and they have your details and you borrow a book, they can prompt you, they can give you information on when you need to return it, they can remind you, they can start charging you on a daily, weekly basis until you return it. You do not own that book. And it's the same with me walking into a bookshop and buying a mm. book and then saying, you know, you could always drop it back if you don't like it. <laughs> There's a very different mindset and monetization of any business model needs to take these elements into a lot of thinking because there is a lot of drive at the moment around deposits and it does work in certain jurisdictions and certain cities which have historically worked on deposits and for single use it's so nominal where whereas for reuse you are looking at packaging items that could be of value of one, two dollars or five or ten, depending on their complexity and what materials they're using. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so those, I hope that wasn't a very long answer to your question. I always felt that those are the fundamental two that I really wanted to share with everybody here, just, just to give you guys a bit of an insight on how we approach it. No, it's wonderful, Sophia. And the fact that you're out there doing this is wonderful as well. I mean, you're, you're actually making it happen. So that's, 
Wonderful to have you with us today. And, and I think the chat box should be lighting up and Andrea is going to tell us what are the hottest and most burning questions in the chat box in just a moment. But I want to direct our last question to Rachel Gray from RAP, who works a lot on campaigns. And um, Rachel, you've now heard from someone who's out there getting it done. You've heard from uh, two policymakers who are responsible for setting up the field of play. What do you say about the campaigns and, and how are these reports going to help us make better campaigns? Hello and good afternoon. Um, I think it's really interesting um, listening to all of the speakers today coming at it from um, different angles. But I think at the heart of this, we've always got to consider human behaviour. And one thing that strikes me is policy making is a very rational thought process, but the way we act in our daily lives isn't necessarily that rational. Um, so we, we do things on psychological urges and needs, and that always needs to be built into thinking. For example, with the coffee cup, we're not thinking about disposable reuse, any of those things. We're thinking about getting a hot coffee because we need the caffeine and we're on our way to work. You know, that's what we're thinking about. So I think with any policy instrument, it's always putting people at the heart of it. And sometimes I think sometimes we forget in our policy making that we are people as well um, and we need to think about these things in the real life. So that that's kind of where campaigns and nudges come in. And I think the report that Ellie has is a fantastic read. Go and read mm. it. But I can actually say these things work from my perspective. You know, we have used positive emotion is huge. A lot of policy instruments can come across as quite dry and a little bit scary. You know, the word ban isn't something to incite really good behavior change from people. It's a scary thing, banning. You need to tell people what banning means to them, be specific, use humor, create hope, optimism, even love for banning. You know, you need to turn that around. So I think that's great. And the use of social norms, I'm a huge fan of social mm. norms in actually implementing policy because, for example, we've been running a social norming campaign at RAP for about 18 months campaigning and it's changed the behavior of 8.9 million people in those 18 months we've been measuring it to do more recycling it works mm. that's the other part so that's the other thing and one other thing that we actually haven't touched on today where policy and behavior change and campaigns come in are keeping on top of misleading green claims we cannot be undermined by people taking what is seeming to be a great idea, whether it's policy or campaign led and using it for purposes to potentially mislead. So keeping on top of misleading green claims is also something that needs to be put in the mix. And, and finally, it's you know campaigns bring to life what we want people to do in a way that's useful for them in their environment and context. Yeah, okay. make it come to life. Thank you so much, Rachel. That um, sounds like really good uh, words for the wise for all of us. Um, colleagues, we're bumping against the outer limit of our time here, but Andrea, I'm just going to turn to you for what is what's happening in the chat box. What um, where is the gist of the conversation going in terms of those hot questions? Well, we've got um, about 10, 15 questions in the chat, and I think a lot of them are being answered uh, in real time. So please watch the chat there for the for answers as we're 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 posting answers as well. I do want to have a shout out um, for a another report, actually, and it's also in the chat. Um, there is a report which is called Addressing Single Use Plastics products pollution using a life cycle approach. And I'm, I'm just going to give a shout out to that and the link there because it connects very well um, with the discussion that we've had here today. I also want to have maybe a quick question uh, for Rachel, and it is what is the next step for real life rollout of nudges described in the report? You have one minute. OK, so at RAP, we're supporting the rollout of the coffee cup green nudges. And I think where the next stage is we've done some work to do some pre-testing to find out how people will take to these nudges. I think the next rollout, it's really important to engage with the businesses in actually rolling out. As um, Stephen alluded to, we, we're coming hopefully out of the pandemic. 
you know, it's all about recovery, it's all about new norms. So there's an idea opportunity now to introduce something new, but it needs to work for the business owners, of course, who are desperate to get their businesses up and running again. So I think it's a great opportunity. So the next steps are to review the data that we have looking at the green nudges and work with um, some of you guys on the call to work out how it can be implemented in Sweden. Is that a minute? <laughs> Really well done. You're good, thank you. Andrea, so we're in the home stretch here. I hope colleagues, if you have questions, you put them in the chat box. I hope they are getting answered by the um, individuals who are on the call today who are deeply knowledgeable on these topics. I wish we had an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes to really do justice to this topic, but it's probably one of many conversations going forward. I just wanted to mention that um, Sweden will be hosting Stockholm Plus 50 next year in 2022 when UN Environment Programme turns 50 and the world salutes its 50th anniversary of environment and development in the UN. And sustainable living will no doubt be a huge part of that, as will youth and plastics. Um, so we can all contribute. And I think the reports that have been launched today have been wonderful for guiding us in this. And I would just like to end by thanking you, Andrea and Eva from the Swedish EPA from, uh, for hosting the conversation, Sophia from the Ministry of Environment for all of your support to UNEP. And I'm supposed to make a pitch to a last slide as well. And Andrea, I don't know if it's up there. There it is. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to Andrea who is at the epicenter of this discussion. Please visit our website at the One Planet Network um, and follow us and get the word out. So thank you very much, colleagues. And Andrea, back to you for any last words. I think we're good. I put all of the, uh, a lot of the links to the reports and the campaign's website and um, also in the chat box. So please see that there and you will receive a, a copy of this presentation and the, uh, the recorded uh, session. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.